Thank you, Tom, for that um, loving and encouraging word in due season. I, I had a chance to speak with uh, Tom before we um, opened this session and agreed that a word of prayer would also be a fitting and lovely way to start. So, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the origin and source of all wisdom and of all truth. You are yourself wisdom and truth. Be with us in our intellect, in our heart and mind as we search after you. And may this time together in speaking and hearing be always in tribute and honor of you. And may you instruct us so that we can learn after you and your son who is the living word and living truth, come down to earth in his name and following his holy way, we pray. Amen. This morning I want to reflect with you on uh, this verse and the events that stand behind it from the Gospel of John. Uh, in the Supper Discourses, our Lord says, and this is eternal life, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The night has now descended Judas has gone out to do that which he must do, and that quickly. But he is not alone in this work of the night. Peter, too, will enter the night and join denial to Judas's betrayal. In the night, Thomas has confessed that he does not know the way Jesus has traveled these long months toward Jerusalem. And Philip will disclose that in this darkness, he has still not seen the Father, though he be manifested day by day in the person and works of the one he has sent. Betrayal, denial, confusion and ignorance, all these the gospel tells us are the works of the night. As the world's light, Jesus stands in the midst of the night, sanctifying himself in the prayer for his disciples that marks him as priest in the act of final self-offering. At the heart of this high priestly prayer, Jesus confirms his own vocation as life giver and defines for the disciples, for us, the life eternal which he bestows. This is eternal life, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now the problem that often goes antiseptically by the title theological epistemology should properly be anchored in the testimony John the Evangelist records, knowledge of God leads to life eternal, and it is shadowed by ignorance, by denial and betrayal, most especially by those devoted to the Lord. This twin structure of knowledge and denial outlines the task of a Christian theological anthropology. On one hand, in this locus, we aim to set forth how knowledge of God is possible, how, that is, the human nature we study and bear can truly attain the knowledge 
that is the creature's blessing and perfection. The knowledge of divine reality that is our highest end, our richest possession. But this task cannot stand alone. Its shadow and its parody, the deeply human states of ignorance and confusion, the sinful states of denial and betrayal also belong to a proper theological epistemology. For the Holy Gospels tell us that our human condition is made for God and finds its deepest humanity, its fullest freedom there. All our knowledge at base and in the end leads to this one ideal, the superabundant luminous thought of God. Yet, these same Gospels tell us more, that the knowledge which is our possibility and our perfection enacts another inexplicable possibility, the denial and disowning of the one truth that our intellect was made for. It seems then that the human creature exemplifies two possibilities, knowledge and denial of the one thing needful, the one eternal health of the mortal mind. We know and do not know the Lord God who made us. Now, how can such things be? I want here to consider the odd and alien position we are in as creatures of the good God. How is it that our hearts and minds can be fashioned for God, that we can truly know our Lord, that we can think this thought and enter into this joy, this eternal joy, yet at once deny, belittle, and unthink it, our own best end. By almost any account of knowledge, this should be impossible. A cognitive impossibility in the same rank as the classical trisected angle or the squared circle. A deep puzzlement should overspread us when we consider the human person and its actions toward its God. The Creator has made us to know one thought above all, and we can know it. Yet against our own happiness and liberty, we do not know it, and scorn and trivialize and pass it by on the other side as we stride piously toward the temple. As Calvin noted so acutely, idolatry is the act of drawing near to God in order to inwardly flee him. It is as though we opened our eyes on the loveliest of scenes, saw it, and then looked away. Indeed, denied we ever knew it. Students of Anselm will recognize the proper source of this analogy. This is a chasm opening up in the very structure and coherence of theological anthropology and knowledge. It is a radical disorder in our intellect that cannot be repaired by an ordinary appeal to the philosophical doctrine known as fallibilism. Now this may surprise because it appears at first glance as if fallibilism were designed in its very contours to handle a riddle of the kind I have posed here. A fallibilist in epistemology holds that human knowledge is compatible with error. I can believe I know something, but in fact I am wrong. I can make mistakes, even about elements I think I know well. I can misunderstand the grounds on which I know such things. I can be deceived even in my certainties. 
fallibilism, that is, can come in varying degrees. Affirming the possibility of error from particular facts and theories to widespread explanations of human affairs, our so-called master narratives, to the foundations we have considered certain, self-evident, and undeniable. Everyone, that is, can sign up for fallibilism, from the modest student who knows she does not know everything, to the relativist or nihilist who knows we know nothing at all. Even the high priest of rationalism, René Descartes, could subscribe to a certain attenuated form of fallibilism. He knew that we could slumber even after our vigorous application of proper method, and our creaturely will could lead us to slovenly forgetfulness, prizing semblances over the crisp security of the clear and distinct idea. All this might lead us to proclaim our problem solved. We can know and do know the only true God, but we can also be wrong. We can misunderstand his nature or commandments. We can forget what we look like in the mirror of his law. We can think we know God and rest in that certainty Yet, in truth, we know nothing but an idol, a thing made by hands. All this sounds human and humane. Indeed, it would be hard to find a thoughtful or reasonable person who did not know that she or he could be mistaken. It seems the first mark of a charlatan that everything is known, everything explained. Fallibilism preserves the proper humility of a human creature of God. Knowing the world in this temporal and partial way, even in its highest preserves, yet not knowing reality as does our God, perfectly, wholly, and without shadow of turning or of error. Why should we not extend this deeply humane vision of our limited and modest scope to the knowledge of God? Why should we not say that even in our highest thought, perhaps especially there, we could stand in the wrong? Perhaps what I have called a deep riddle is not one at all but merely the most familiar condition of any human being uh, that any human being can enter, a knower who makes mistakes. Sadly, I do not believe that this ancient and wise and decent answer can actually unknot the enigma that overspreads our human lot. And this, because the object of human knowledge, the object who is God, is utterly, surpassingly unique. The idea of God is not like any other, and his luminous reality does not belong in any class or kind or genus, as St. Thomas said long ago. Now, students of epistemology will notice that this is an odd reason indeed for me to deny fallibilism as conceptual answer to our riddle. For it has been an honorable part of our Christian tradition to say that precisely because God is transcendent, utterly one, utterly unique, human intellects cannot know God fully or infallibly or comprehensively. Indeed, the entire apophatic tradition in theology has borrowed a leaf from fallibilism. With this object, if nowhere else it is said, we can know only in part, and that in a glass darkly. We are not comprehenders, to borrow a term from the scholastic tradition, 
God may be known by us, but not comprehended, not fully embraced and analyzed by the power of our minds. God cannot be known by creatures, Thomas says, from first principles, as though he were a theorem or deduction. His essence, Thomas says, in some texts and at some seasons cannot be known in this life. All this makes fallibilism sound like the most natural companion to theological epistemology and the most ready explanation for our woeful misunderstanding and defiance of this our truest and highest thought. But I believe, in fact, that God's unshakable aseity, his utter unicity and transcendence makes fallibilism an unlikely contender as solvent to our stubborn ignorance of God. <clears throat> this is because knowledge of God, in virtue of his radical aseity, does not enter into our domain of cognition as do the creaturely objects of thought. This is not to say that God cannot become object, certainly not. It is a central, ineluctable element in theological epistemology to affirm that Almighty God can become an object to our intellect. The perduring and explosive subjectivity of God, the awe-filled expression of God as I am, does not erase or supersede his objectivity. Indeed, it is just his transcendent reality as subject that makes his objectivity possible for our creaturely minds. This is to affirm with Bard that God remains subject even or intensively in his objectivity. So we may say after all the noisy warfare over subject and object in knowledge of God, that the reason fallibilism will not resolve our riddle about divine knowledge cannot rest upon problems of objectivity and knowledge. Here I part with Kant decisively. Rather, it rests upon the telos or goal for which this particular knowledge exists. Before I expand upon this notion of theological knowledge's telos, let me turn more deeply to the anthropological foundations for fallibilism that motivate the whole program. Consider, for example, the customary warrants for fallibilism. It is usually argued that human beings are not infallible because that trait is not given to human nature and its intellect. The human creature is finite, its cognitive structure limited and mortal. Now, if you are a thinker like me, you say fervently, just so. I know none better that I have severe limits in my scope, perspicuity, and depth of my very human intellect. It is a knowledge of creaturehood, that is, that makes fallibilism persuasive. The object of knowledge is known, Thomas says, according to the mode of the knower. We know those things that it is possible for such creatures as we to know through our senses or through our rationality, through empiricism or rationalism. We need not decide here between them. And that sum is finite. We cannot know, cannot comprehend, cannot recall everything. And our judgment is fallible in just this sense. Our little lives are rounded by a sleep. Notice here that fallibilism is a doctrine built up out of recognition of human anthropology. Our minds work in this limited and frail manner, and even those things we know with certainty, 
the principles of logic or of mathematics, say, are not limitless, nor do they warrant, even for Descartes, a claim that our knowledge is without error. The mode of the knower, Thomas argues, determines the manner and scope of our knowledge, and that is finitude. Fallibilism is an anthropological or creaturely claim of this kind. We might extend this reflection about the grounds for the fallibility of human thought by considering the great disturbance of the 19th century, the eruption of historical thinking in the programmatic study of culture in Western Europe. Historical consciousness, as this movement was often termed, did not simply refer to a human knowledge of its past, the history of a nation or people, or the development of a geological pattern on the earth. This may have served the brave intellects of the German Enlightenment, the Aufklärer, but it could not meet the demands of the radical historicists of the 19th century. In this form of late modernism, historical thinking became the primary form or nature of creaturely cognition itself. History was now seen as the mode of human knowing, not simply its content, and the framework of all historical awareness is change. The becoming and passing away of movements, lives, institutions, laws, are the expression of a mind structured by mutability, by change. We might put it this way. History is no longer simply the term for past cultures. It is not outside us, but rather within. We are history, and our minds are history as cognition. This we might consider a form of pure rationalism now under the conditions of historicity. Now this kind of radical historicity clearly permeates through the borders of our skin. Our very creaturehood is now historicized. This leads to a particular form of fallibilism in much modern theology. Historical consciousness is limited, certainly. We know and can know only so much about the past and even more so about ourselves. But it is also ambiguous. Historical thinking does not arrive at deductive conclusions. It does not offer demonstrations, as do the workings of logical syllogisms. It does not spring from clear and distinct ideas. Indeed, it is not transparent here that there can be foundations in the epistemic sense in historical thinking at all. Rather, the thought of history is the living awareness of the opacity, obscurity, and the riddle of all human becoming. This is not a radical skepticism. Historians of this school do not deny the possibility of knowledge. Rather, the form of historical knowledge assumes, rather the form historical knowledge assumes is that of the temporal creature itself, the welter of drives and passions and hopes that animate us, the larger than life dynamics of the peoples and institutions that surround us, the profound uncertainty of causes and aims that underlie our great human endeavors, from the outbreak of war to the development of the sonnet or linear perspective. Each generation, each scholar makes history afresh because we simply cannot penetrate to the very bottom 
of temporal becoming, we cannot master our own inwardness. Now, this form of historical thinking caused a particular soul sickness in Christian reflection upon the life of Jesus of Nazareth, the one who entered our history and became also an earthly creature within it. In the midst of upheavals throughout Europe in the 19th century, theology too was shaken by this radical form of historicism. Jesus Christ became an historical figure. He became the subject of study under the description of the historical Jesus. It is no discovery of today that this development put special strain on the Christian confidence about its Lord. What now could be known of him, this generation asked, and what known with joyful reliability? I do not need to rehearse for anyone in this room the melancholy struggles Albert Schweitzer records so fully in his literary tour de force, The Quest of the Historical Jesus. Our quest here, after all, is not history as content, which details of Jesus' earthly life can be known, which cannot or must not or must be denied, should such there be, nor how the relation of Holy Scripture to historical study must be adjudicated or reconciled. Rather, we are considering here how historical thinking as a mode of human knowing will affect the proper knowledge of the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. We have to reckon with the possibility that knowledge of the one who is sent will be governed now by this mode, the ambiguity, the uncertainty and fallibilism of historical consciousness. An entire generation of dogmaticians fell under this spell. From the young Bart to Tillich in all seasons of his long career, to Boltmann and his many disciples, the radical nature of historical thinking impinged directly on the Christian's knowledge of the earthly Jesus. What was obstacle to an earlier generation became a strength. 20th century Protestant dogmaticians held that the historical dimension of the incarnate Lord could not be known fully or with certainty. Indeed, for some disciples of Boltmann or Kaler, he could not be known at all. More radical still was the claim that the earthly flesh of Jesus Christ was a barrier to knowledge of the Son of God. Jesus Christ, in virtue of his historical existence, was the hidden God. History blinded our eyes to the deity in our midst. In the searing second edition to his commentary on Romans, the young Bart can speak powerfully, hauntingly, of a Jesus who slips from view, submerged into the flux of historical change, a historical figure unplumbed and unheralded by historical knowing. It seems that historical consciousness has given us a form of fallibilism that radicalizes the puzzle we are here exploring. It seems that a human mind that is saturated by movement and change, structured by it, can see in an earthly figure only the shadows and traces of knowledge. He comes to us, as Schweitzer plaintively wrote, as one unknown. So, historical fallibilism appears to answer to at least one pole of our dilemma. 
according to its canons, we cannot know the one whom God has sent just because he was sent. Just because he became, that is, an earthly historical being, all the while remaining God. This is Barth's formulation in the later volumes of the Church Dogmatics. Fallibilism receives its full due here. Of course we can be mistaken about Jesus of Nazareth, this school says. Indeed, we cannot help doing so. For such thinkers, the Apostle Paul emerges from the lists as their champion. Remember 1 Corinthians 2. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The betrayal, denial, cruelty, and cool indifference to Jesus can be explained, perhaps even excused, by the historical guise the Son of God wore. Peter and Thomas, perhaps even Judas himself, can be forgiven their proud alliance with the knight, so these critics might say, just because historical beings can never know perfectly, but will always enter into the world under the severe constraints of ignorance, uncertainty, and ambiguity. Christ's existence as flesh and our knowledge katasarka entails that we too will misunderstand, misinterpret, and overlook the truths about this man for others. His historicity is hiddenness in its very form. For historical thinking, Vreda's messianic secret is no puzzle waiting explanation. It is simply the outworking of historical intellects attempting to grasp a historical subject and finding instead only ignorance and folly. Or so historical fallibilists will argue. But we have not actually reckoned here with the full measure of the dilemma before us. Long ago in famous words, Gotthold Lessing gave us a version of this full reckoning. You will recognize these celebrated words from his treatise on the proof of the spirit and of power. Contingent truths of history, Lessing wrote, can never be proof of the necessary truths of reason. That, then, is the ugly great ditch which I cannot cross. However often and however earnestly, I have tried to make that leap. Now, notice that Lessing, though preceding his 19th century descendants by a full century, sees more clearly than they the dilemma that has occupied us today. He grasps firmly that both history and conceptual logic concern truths and even more important for our topic, Lessing knows that such truths go to the heart of human benediction and salvation. Just this, the fourth gospel lays before us in stark terms. The knowledge of God and of his Son is eternal life. We might transpose that proclamation into Lessing's idiom for a moment. The necessary and saving truth of eternal life rests upon the contingent historical truth of the one who was sent. Now, we need not adopt Lessing's whole programmatic to see that he has placed his finger on the exact pointed issue for us. We are concerned here with eternal manners, with truth as saving, 
and we do not know how to relate, much less ground, that knowledge in the life of the Son who went in and out among us. I, might, I may say that for my part, I think Lessing commits a version of the genetic fallacy, the claim that an idea's origin determines its validity. To endorse such a view is to make scriptural revelation impossible. And perhaps this comes closer to the ugly ditch than Lessing cared to say in his analysis of forms of truth. But suffice it to say here, we need not bow our heads down before Lessing's essay as if we here encounter an unanswerable antinomy. Lessing's great strength as a Christian controversialist is to show us just why knowledge is vital to the Christian faith and what its proud claims contain. When we think of this knowledge, we think eternity. So we can say that as a philosophical doctrine, fallibilism registers for us the nature of human knowing, its limitation and particularity, its temporal mode, and the profound ignorance of the living change before us. But fallibilism cannot register the significance of knowledge for the Christian. In the domain of the Christian faith, we are not simply making mistakes about dates or customs or properties of natural objects. We are not merely admitting we are unable to gather and hold in memory the rich details of the historical and physical universe. And we are not simply recognizing that we are unsure of the grounds and proper warrants for all this finite knowing. In the Christian faith, we are rather to confess that our eternal life rests upon the knowledge of God and his incarnate Son. It is urgent and ultimate. It is final. Fallibilism gives us a way of speaking about the region Martin Luther called bare or historical knowledge. We can know, we can be mistaken about the ordinary facts of Jesus' life or the names, places, particulars of Israel's covenant life with God. But Luther, no more than the teachers of the Via Moderna who preceded him, did not worry over much about such factual historical detail. The anxiety, the struggle of the Christian life turned on saving knowledge. Did we know Jesus Christ as the one for us? Do we know him as savior? Did we confess him as incarnate God? Did we acknowledge we have a Lord the one who was sent. In this knowledge, Luther said, our salvation lies, and we must be urgent in season and out to acquire, confess, and seek after this word. This is the stern matter of theological epistemology that fallibilism cannot address or contain. For Christ's instruction in the Gospel of John raises us up beyond the mode or structure of human cognition. This is no longer a study of how the object of thought resides in the knower, nor how many such objects can be encompassed in the finite intellect, nor the clarity with which we can derive and assess these thoughts. Indeed, we might even say that to follow this verse from John to its radical end is to question, perhaps even deny, Thomas's famous maxim that the object is known in the mode of the knower. For the fourth gospel tells us 
that the knowledge of God is the salvation of the intellect. Just so, and here we endorse the medieval scholastic wholeheartedly, Thomas tells us we human beings must be able to know God truly. In this, he echoes Augustine's moving description of the human creature as core inquietum, a restless heart that rests only in God, the one for whom we are made. Note the force of this claim. If God has made us for communion with him, and if our eternity rests on such knowledge, the benevolence of God is under threat if we cannot attain this knowledge and cannot know it with proper firmness. I do not say with certainty here. I think Descartes' insistence upon unshakable or certain knowledge has not served us well. I say instead proper firmness. Calvin held, at least in part, that human beings were endowed with a sensus divinitatis, a created longing for God, and a rational instinct, if we may put it so, that a divine governor orders and upholds this fragile world. In the well-studied and richly complex opening to the Institutes, Calvin writes, there is within the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, an awareness of divinity. This we take to be beyond controversy. We may say in passing that nothing marks the distance between Calvin's day and our own more than this last remark on the opening to the Institutes. Calvin continues, to prevent anyone from taking refuge in the pretense of ignorance, God himself has implanted in all people a certain understanding of his divine majesty. From this confident beginning, Calvin elaborates a doctrine of knowledge of God that carefully, skillfully, and technically aims to steer between a theological epistemology that affirms creaturely knowledge of God, yet insists upon our sinful confusion and hypocrisy, such that revelation is needed to draw our implicit instincts to explicit faith and full confession of the true God. Testimony to the rich complexity of chapter three, indeed of the entire book one, is the fact that both Schleiermacher and Barth could claim Calvin for their own. Far beyond the scope of this small essay is the further terrain of revelation as doctrine and text, of common grace and imago dei, of arguments from design, and the status of human integrity after the fall and the loss of that first Eden. But we can certainly see if from a distance how our more narrow landscape overlooks this terrain and how proper knowledge of God in one sense holds the whole of faith in a brief compass. Here we simply note that Kelvin continues the long Augustinian tradition of affirming that human beings are made for God and made for knowing him. They are deiform in this strict sense that creaturehood is endowed with a passionate and intellectual desire for God and can indeed know him and are blessed in such Godward motion. So we must return to our original questions. How can creatures made of dust, finite and partial as we are, come to this firm knowledge, both of the true God and of the mission of the Son? 
What capacities do we possess as children of God to enter into such final saving truths? As is well known, Bard in his early years roared out his answer to Brunner in response to such questions, nine, no, there is no human capacity, no point of contact, no natural power to know God as he must be known above and on this earth. Bard in these years had little trouble accounting for the works of the night, the denial, ignorance, and betrayal of the earthly son, or the rebellion of idolatry and transgression that Israel manifested toward the true God. Indeed, it seemed as if such ignorance and rebellion were the second nature of human creatures. We are godless in a very strong sense of the word. It was for this radical redrawing of the main outlines of Calvin's doctrine of knowledge that Hans Urs von Balthasar early on charged Barth with the inability to confirm or endorse a full doctrine of creation. Bard in those years insisted that divine grace alone, the impossible possibility, could disclose the true God and reveal his son to us, the lost sinners enclosed in the night. This is a strongly apocalyptic view and it possesses the powerful attraction of a dilemma hardened into a virtue. We cannot know God, Bart wrote in an early essay, yet we must. So we can only admit our inability and give God the glory. This is a kind of Kantianism, a, a radical, lessing-like concentration upon the ugly ditch that is now proclaimed as the very engine of grace, the gift of knowledge that comes down vertically from above, the impossible that God alone makes possible. But has this brave insistence upon the knife edge of revealed knowledge properly squared itself with this claim of Augustinians early and late that we are made for God and made to know him. I want to spend the last few minutes of this address considering this question in light of our key text from the Gospel of John. I believe we must begin this task by affirming that we creatures can and do have the knowledge of the true God. I believe it is vital to affirm that we do have such knowledge, but under the conditions of diverse and sometimes inadequate descriptions. Students of epistemology will recognize the distinction I am attempting to draw here. I argue here for knowledge under a description. This is the distinction that belongs in the history of philosophy to the great controversialist and logician Bertrand Russell. For Russell, knowledge can be divided into two large halves, those things we know by acquaintance and those we know by description. I don't want to lean too heavily on Russell here. My point can swing free of the well-built construction Russell advances in his epistemology. But I do want to suggest that knowledge has some kind of intimate tie to the way we describe the object known. Let me use a brief example to illustrate the distinction. Say that I tell you I know a certain theologian who has written a book, many books really, under the title Biblical Authority After Babel. I know he teaches in a distinguished seminary in the Midwest, and I know that I might describe him as a student of Nicholas Lash, a theologian carrying out some of Lash's intuitions 
in the great work of theology. Now, many of you here today will say, I know him. That's Professor Kevin Van Hooser. Perhaps you say, turning to your neighbor, I didn't know that he studied with Nicholas Lash. That's interesting. Very helpful to know. Now, notice what is happening here. I offer you descriptions of this celebrated scholar. You recognize him in these descriptions, but you know him by another avenue. You know him by acquaintance. You take his courses. You sit next to him in chapel and at prayers. You join him for lunch or in a committee room. He is the one you know, and this is critical for our purposes, even if you don't know all of the descriptions that I mentioned, or even if you get them wrong. Perhaps you thought he wrote after Babel, and now learn that George Steiner wrote that book. Kevin Van Hooser, in fact, wrote Biblical Authority after Babel. You still know Professor Van Hooser, and you are right to say, even in the midst of this mistake, I know him truly. In just this way, fallibilism that could not answer our whole dilemma can enter into our theological epistemology by the back door, so to say. Mutatis mutandis, we can say that we know Almighty God truly and as frail human creatures under a description. I believe that Calvin's sense of deity that is implanted within each of us is this capacity to know the true God under many varied descriptions, some but not all of them mistaken. The one true God may be known as he was to Georg Cantor or Rene Descartes as absolute infinite, or he may be known as he was to the young Augustine as truth itself, or he may be known under the description of mystery, as perhaps our ancestor Jacob did at Bethel, when the cry burst from his lips, how awesome is this place. God was in this place and I did not know it. God may be known by those very far distant from the church, under descriptions that seem abstract and strange, perhaps, yet also oddly familiar. Perhaps the Lord God is known as meaning, or recovery from illness or trauma, or help in time of need, or beauty in touch or sound or sight. These, we might say, are partial descriptions initial, perhaps even confused ideas about the one triune God of the Christian faith. And these descriptions might be admixed with error. Perhaps God is known only as power or force, as reality, say, but without personality or will. This is a partial and in places erroneous description, God is essentially personal, yet a human being who has described a dynamism beyond all cosmic and creaturely powers has named the true God, or so I say. And I think Kelvin, in his remarkable opening book of the Institutes, would agree at least in part, and with some corrections, I think, too. Indeed, I think I hear his voice even now chiding me for leaving to one side the guilt of our errors and confusions, our superstitions and idolatries, our sins against our Creator and Judge, and our blindness to the Creator's manifold and glorious works. And I agree that a full theological accounting of our knowledge of God cannot be forged apart from a decisive doctrine of sin and of salvation. But I believe Kelvin is gracious and generous, too, 
and has this to say to my proposal. Just as old or bleary-eyed men and those with weak vision, if you thrust before them a most beautiful volume, even if they recognize it to be some sort of writing, yet can scarcely construe two words, but with the aid of spectacles, will begin to read distinctively. So scripture, gathering up the otherwise confused knowledge of God in our minds, having dispersed our dullness, clearly shows us the true God. He has from the beginning and from the beginning maintained this plan for his church. So that besides these common proofs, he also puts forth his word, which is a more direct and more certain mark whereby he is to be recognized. Here, Calvin sets out a remarkable distinction between the confused and the general on one side and the clear and certain and direct on the other. So it seems that there are degrees of knowledge, not simply the true and the false. It may well be that the lingering and axial question of salvation can be addressed in this way. Perhaps the saving knowledge of God and his Son is the clarified vision of eternal being, eternal life. And perhaps always it is grace beyond measure, grace even to the ignorant, the sinful, and the mistaken. Perhaps the seed that is sown even on thin or rocky soil, the soil of denial, betrayal, and ignorance, remains truly the word. The relation between creaturely knowledge of God and our salvation is the deepest question of theological epistemology and perhaps lies beyond our mortal comprehension. If Calvin is right about the census divinitatis, and I am right even in part about our creaturely knowledge of God, then the riddle and offense of sin only deepens. The night must be impossible unthinkable, just that. This cognitive contradiction cannot be incorporated by fallibilism. It repels it, in fact. The final weakness of the fallibilist tradition, we might say, is that it explains too much, reasons and reasons away the profound incoherence and self-parody that is the denial and betrayal of God. Such sin cannot be, yet it is, an undeniable event waged against the life of our Lord and waged by us, the ones who know. In the midst of this very great enigma and scandal, it remains true and a gift of our good creator that we know the true God under a description. But we can say with proper firmness that Holy Scripture is a sharpening grace for the creature's eyes, the reading glasses for the seekers after God. In Holy Scripture, we have a full and proper description of God. He is the true one who sent his only begotten into the world. We did not err in our original and tentative thoughts about God. They were blurred and surely partial, but they were true words, a true instinct, and a true creaturely grasp of the one who is reality itself. But we can be instructed, we can be helped, we can be purified and elevated in our knowledge. The eyes of our mind can be enlightened. And in the unspeakable mercy of God, we can know also by acquaintance. We can be moved by the spirit of the sun. We can taste 
that God is good. And above all other earthly knowings, we can be given the more excellent way to know and to love the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sonderegger. Well, now would be the time for some questions, uh, and we've got microphones on either side. So if uh, you are one of those that have a question, please uh, make your way there. Um, I will uh, begin uh, as you are thinking maybe about a question. Uh, you state uh, that reason can know God, and yet reason fails to do so. Uh, summarize for us the implications of the noetic effects of the fall, implications of that, how much, again, you talked about some of it, but in some ways yeah. it's a brief summary of, of some things you've said. And then the necessity of um, the Holy Spirit you made reference to 1 Corinthians 2. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and the notion of knowing God is Trinitarian. Uh, so what right, are the implications right. of the Holy Spirit uh, mm, in, in mm. the Trinitarian economy for, uh, for our knowledge, uh, true knowledge yeah. of God? Yeah, a lovely, lovely question. And um, you can see in the paper that I... I think the doctrine of sin and the fall are, are going to be central in any full theological epistemology. Uh, what I, I want to avoid here in the, the paper is the suggestion that the, uh, the fall has uh, destroyed our cognitive abilities in such a way um, that we cannot know God in a, I suppose I'd say, in a natural state. I, I want to affirm a, a kind of sensus divinitatis, a, a natural instinct for God. And this, I, th I think, is in virtue of our being uh, created in the image and likeness, and that God has uh, made us for himself. That I take to be the force of John 17 there, that uh, knowledge of God is eternal life. Uh, so it, it must be that sin has a role in our knowledge that is not the same thing as a partial description. It's not quite the same as error, say. Um, it, instead, I think uh, sin should be a third in any theological structure. It, it should be something we can't actually incorporate. And it resists all full rational treatment. There, there should be something about sin and about the fall that is uh, conceptually impossible. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to suggest in the paper where I say uh, that I think um, fallibilism in its uh, ordinary construal and in this historical form explains too much. That is that we uh, don't know God in the same way that um, we don't know particle physics. You know, there, there just are these things that we don't know and we don't get right and we uh, study for the exam and we forget. And uh, so we, we thought we knew something about quanta, but we can't quite remember what they are. Um, th uh, that, I think, is uh, to make sin an element, a, a rational element within a larger <coughs> epistemology. What we want in sin in the fall is some kind of disruption that cannot be cognitively comprehended. Uh, and it can't um, uh, replace the function of thinking about um, more complete and less complete description. Uh, now certainly, 
the, uh, the knowledge of God that is um, quickened in us uh, is this traditional mission of the Holy Spirit in the life of those who seek and are drawn to him. Uh, now, uh, here notice I'm, I'm thinking that uh, Thomas's claim uh, that knowledge is known in the mode of the knower it is actually uh, expanded and overcome by this emphasis on uh, God's presence to the intellect. So I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, you can see I'm, I'm more uh, Platonizing, more Augustinian here. I'm, I'm thinking uh, that knowledge of God is uh, God's illumination of our intellect and that it elevates us in such a way that we know beyond our, our, node, our, our mode of knowing. And uh, in this way, the Holy Spirit is instructing us um, in, in what is sometimes called that double inspiration, the, uh, the inward inspiration of the reader and the inspiration of the text. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Yeah, please, uh, if you'd come to the microphone. Yes, one of the two, either one. Yes. Well, thank, thank you first for that. That was really, that was helpful and gives a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. um, I, just a question about what, what was just said about like um, that, uh, in some level, I, I take it that you're pushing back on Aquinas that, um, the mode of the knower determines, mm -hmm. to, in some mm -hmm. extent, what is known because God can raise us above the right, up, above our mode of knowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, if you could unpack that, because I, I take it, of course, you're not saying that like we we would know God as God knows Himself or anything like that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, and it, and I also take it you would agree that on some extent, humans humans can't like have infinite knowledge. Like that is a logical contradiction given, given, given what we are. So then in what sense can God raise us above um, the mode of our knowing as human yeah, beings? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And um, uh, as you were asking your question, I thought, well, maybe a Thomist would come back and say uh, uh, this, it just w what we talk about in sanctification is a kind of elevation of the intellect. So maybe, Thomas would have a way to, um, to answer my own worries about his position here. Uh, well, let me put it to you this way. See what you think about this. You remember that, that uh, Thomas holds that, that Christ has uh, perfect knowledge. Um, he, he's in, in a not in a technical sense, but in a kind of ordinary philosophical sense, uh, omniscient, that is, that he knows all things. He has all infused types of knowledge. He, uh, he is without ignorance. He, um, he has a perfect and complete knowledge. Now, that's sometimes thought to be a docetic element in Thomas's Christology. But what if we said instead what we're being shown there is that uh, the uh, intellect, the human intellect, has a capacity that is a creaturely infinite. Um, I think Rahner heads in this direction, right? Uh, that it is something like uh, Cantor's trans-finite uh, numbers. They're, they're, uh, that we have in the human intellect a kind of um, creaturely form of infinity, and this is realized in Christ. And so we're seeing actually what the elevated intellect looks like in a um, in a creature that is perfect, perfectly obedient, and uh, without sin. Mm. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, please. 
Hi. Um, really love the lecture. Thank you uh, for that today. I think it's a, a really important topic, uh, especially dealing with the doctrine of creation. So what I wanted to ask is sort of an element implicit in kind of our reception of knowledge um, and even something kind of going forward with that. So with a lot of these implications of um, thinking that there, there needs to be a way for us to truly know God, um, and as we're kind of getting that out of scripture, something else I think Calvin and Bart would both agree with is um, not only our knowing of God uh, is something that needs to be possible, despite its impossibility, but our proclamation of God also needs to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we're kind of looking at the epistemology, not only of our reception and how that's being communicated, but of our then communication of the word of God, um, is there a, sort of a way that this... Um, affirming the trueness of, of our knowledge despite fallibility that would also apply to uh, our communication of our knowledge and what does that look like? Mm, that is lovely, right. You, um, one, one possibility out of the resources I have here uh, might be to think about the uh, descriptions that we use for God uh, and that this would be true in our, our prayers, in our, our preaching, in our teaching, um, that we would uh, attempt to have the fullest and most exact descriptions of God uh, in order that uh, our, uh, our partial and <coughs> limited accounts would be um, it, as complete and full as, as we could give them. Uh, we, we want some way also, I think, to, to do the kind of um, medical intervention, I think, that Calvin suggests. So uh, remember he, he describes um, in that famous image uh, of Scripture as a, a pair of reading glasses, the spectacles of Scripture, it seems to me that in our, our um, Christian conversation, in our teaching and preaching, um, we might have that as part of our aim, so that when people come to us with a, a confused word, a kind of partial description, uh, that our response is not, our first response is not, um, no, that's wrong. Uh, th this is the correct uh, description. It's, it's instead, um, e this is right and there's more. There's, uh, we, we can take this, uh, the, the sense that um, there was some, someone in the room, that there's some power in the world that is not um, composed of and contained by the elements of creation, but there's something more. And uh, we can say, that's right, and here's more about what it is that you know. And I, I think that kind of amplifying of a description is one way in which uh, Christian truth can uh, remain in relation to other forms of this natural instinct for God. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Question? Yeah, please, come to the microphone. Thank you for speaking. Mm, uh, thank you. So in the um, off-cited Romans 1 text, yeah. you have Paul talking about uh, the role of the will in the enlightenment of uh, the mind uh, as well as the suppression of the truth. And I was wondering where you would place uh, the quickening of the will in relation to the enlightenment of the yeah. Uh, intellect. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And uh, what is the role between knowledge and, and will, uh, intellect and will? Um, and of course, it's, it's going to touch on matters of, of sin and whether you think sin is a, a problem of the will principally. Um, I, as you can tell, I'm, I'm thinking that sin is not going to be uh, locatable in 
a, a specific um, power or organism of the person. I, th I think that would be to rationalize it um, too strongly. I, th I would think all of our uh, creaturely nature can be handed over to sin and our, our will included. Uh, but if you, if you wanted to head in that direction, I, I'm not that Cartesian, but I, but I think uh, Descartes has an error theory that is tied in with the will uh, beautifully. And you, if you thought the principal problem in theological knowledge is that we are constantly wandering away and drawn to the things of this world, a, a kind of um, errant will, then I, I think that Descartes' account would be very powerful there. I, I myself think that um, that the uh, partial descriptions that we have of God uh, may simply be um, uh, you know, partial because of uh, who we are, what we've been taught, or what we read. Uh, and so we could have cognitive intellectual errors. Um, we could uh, stubbornly resist. I mean, obviously, the idea that God is judge, and that could be a, a cognitive error about that it pertains to our will, so that we we wish God were not judge, or um, perhaps more sadly still, we uh, we might uh, will and reject uh, that that God is merciful, uh, and. So their uh, will could enter into um, partial or false descriptions. Um, but I, th I think sin is, well, let me, uh, let me put it this way. I, I read Augustine as saying that, that uh, sin is uh, far too powerful to assign it simply to the will. And so I would, take, I would take Paul in Romans 1 to be giving us an account of, of how it is the will participates in sin, uh, but not that it's located exclusively there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Another one here, yeah. and then you'll be next. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make a plug for historical consciousness oh, from good. the 19th okay. century as Great. maybe being able to be incorporated a little more into okay. your theological okay. epistemology. Fire away. And I'm curious to hear what you think of it. So um, it's not that I disagree with anything you said about historical consciousness, but I'm thinking um, the historical Jesus is something that someone like Kahler or Schweitzer talks about. But when you look at Reimarus and Schleiermacher and Strauss, you're yeah. actually talking about the life of Jesus rather than the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when you mm -hmm. look at philosophies of history, there's a lot of folks in the 19th century in Windelband and, and Rickard in the 20th about the individual as sort of the object of historical study as opposed to general laws for scientific study. Uh, so okay. it, it seems like as much as there is this sort of fallibilist contribution that it makes, um, there might also be sort of a, an epistemology of encounter with the individual that we have in historical consciousness. I'm wondering if that could fit yeah. in any way with mm -hmm. the solution that you're offering. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So you're you're suggesting um, that the the problem that Thomas poses in the first question of the Summa about whether science can know particulars. Uh, and that scripture, because it is concerned with individuals, cannot be scientific. Uh, that, that what we should take from uh, 19th century historicism is the conviction that the uh, particular, the individual can be known per se, and that this is a distinct contribution to knowledge that is um, fully scientific, rational, and character. Um, that's a, a lovely thought. Now, I, I um, and it seems to me 
one of the, um, the uh, unsolved problems for us as we think theologically about this historical development is uh, how it is that knowledge that is um, uh, tied to our uh, salvation, our eternal life, that is itself grounded in the, uh, the ambiguity and uncertainty of human life and in individual life, uh, how that is properly incorporated in knowledge that must be um, properly, uh, confidently held. Uh, I, I don't take, I don't take the great historicists uh, to claim that we have reliable knowledge of individuals. Now, you, you might want to correct me on this. I, I, take, I take that tradition that, that is um, summarized in Trelch to be a, a confession of a, a profound ambiguity in our historical knowing and that of particulars and of uh, historical consciousness, and that that very ambiguity is the contribution to our proper knowledge of the world, so, so that we, we recognize our uh, tentativeness and our, uh, our need to be constantly corrected by the individuals and to reconsider the individuals as they uh, gaze up at us out of history. Uh, now, that I think is going to be a, a problem for um, proper confidence about knowledge of God and make the, the uh, knowledge of our Lord in history an element of, uh, of ambiguity that um, is, is going to raise uh, serious questions for our confidence in knowledge of God and, and the Son who is sent. Uh, but maybe you could, maybe you could um, uh, transpose that in another key and say that what is needed in theological epistemology is a virtue, and the virtue is humility and that this is what um, a radical historicism gives us. It's not only the focus on particulars, which is significant since scripture is concerned with uh, individuals and the faith, with the claim on each of us as this very one, uh, but it also inculcates in us the uh, proper uh, modesty and humility that is required for a relationship to God who is perfect and just. But yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Right. Last Thank question, you. please. And then we will end our session together. I, I should answer more quickly and then I could have it's more okay. questions. That's all right. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, thank um, you. So it's quite possible I'm not fully understanding this idea of Divino census as I'm, yeah, tr well, as I'm trying it's, to. Yeah. <laughs> no one understands it perfectly, okay. so you're in safe ground. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, as I'm kind of working through it in my mind, I'm just wondering about the implications um, that it has with the arguments either in favor of or against other uh, faiths of yeah, the world or other good. world religions good, good. Um, because I think uh, an argument for the Christian faith is that we know the true God in his Trinitarian sense yeah, good. Um, and so I guess yeah. where would you distinguish between this idea that we have a sense to know the true God we as in humanity but just with error um, and then how would you draw the line between that and just blatant idolatry yeah yeah good right and it uh, um, 
that little section in there where I say, uh, I, I hear Calvin saying, uh, wait a minute, Sonderegger, I, I, have you really uh, taken the doctrine of sin? Have you really understood uh, guilt? Are you really talking about the same thing that I am? Um, that was a, a section um, put in there to, to try to acknowledge that a, a teaching like the census divinitatis can lead to a, um, an uh, unrestrained universalism where, where we say the knowledge of God is uh, natural to us in such a way uh, that everyone has the knowledge of God, which is eternal life. And you can see uh, universalists like, well, Okay, I should qualify that. A, a universalist in, in impulse, like uh, Karl Rahner, but he's not doctrinally a universalist, but um, people who can speak of anonymous Christianity are, are thinking about how this natural desire and knowledge of God must be perfectly universal. We must be able to say all people have it, and therefore, um, non-Christians have it. Now, what I, what I wanted to suggest in here, uh, and this is a, a, a central question for us in the faith, I, I believe that a devout um, uh, practitioners of other religious traditions know God. They are not all um, idolaters. If we were going to use um, medieval categories, we might say they're heretics. That is, they have a, 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 an imperfect or, or um, incomplete, um, uh, unestablished, unclarified description of God. It, but I think uh, actually uh, they know God uh, perhaps in virtue of the census divinitatis. It, perhaps in virtue of um, common grace, which I think might also be a legacy of Calvin. I, I think, uh, therefore, the a description of God as Trinitarian is not required explicitly in the description to know God truly. Uh, now, and that, I think, is one of the, the great questions for us. But I, I think uh, what uh, a, uh, a devout, um, uh, well, let me take a monotheist rather than a Buddhist, what a devout Hindu knows is, is uh, the God who made her. I think what uh, scripture and the Christian tradition gives us is something like these uh, spectacles, is a clarifying of what it is that a, a devout Hindu knows and a fuller description. And so uh, Trinity, I think, is the fullest description. And I would want ultimately to argue that um, even in these partial descriptions, there is an implicit Trinitarian element to it. But, um, right, but this is, of course, um, something that in our, our faithfulness to God, uh, we, uh, we have to think through um, uh, carefully. It, it's not, it, I mean, I think it's easy to level out religious traditions either as um, uh, false or level them out as all true. And I want instead to argue there's something like degrees of knowledge. Uh, that knowledge, uh, I think there are degrees of being and I think there are degrees of knowledge. And I, I think that's how I would want to answer that. All right, thank you. Uh, let's thank Dr. Sonderegger again. Uh, thank you. Great question.